the next speaker for the, for the day to talk about the 21st century and women leaders. We would like to call upon uh, Faye D'Souza on stage. Faye D'Souza. Faye D'Souza, an award-winning journalist for the millennials, young, fresh, and brutally honest. Faye D'Souza is the executive editor of Mirror Now. She hosts the flagship show, The Urban Debate, and over the last year, has led the editorial team at Mirror Now to break the conventions of primetime news television to refocus on the issues that matter to the Indian citizens. Phase focus on accountability of the government, responsible taxation, safety of women and children, education, health and urban development has resulted in several policy changes and impact developments that have proven that journalists can still bring about improvements in the status quo. Under FACE leadership, Mirror Now has been the recipient of multiple awards in the journalistic world. She has a master's degree in mass communication and a bachelor's degree in journalism and English literature. morning to you. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, the, the entire team at this event for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be out of the studio and not be talking to politicians or about politics for a while. That's always nice. Um, how many ladies do we have in the room? Twenty percent. Okay. Could the ladies say hello so we can hear how strong you are? Hello. So much more than 25, sir. So. <laughs> uh, so I was asked to talk about uh, women leadership, women management. I'm not really sure why this is why people assume that I have something to do with like women empowerment. Um, but I'm really happy to be here. And. Um, I want to just do this very quickly and then we'll pass the mic around and we'll have a conversation because that's always nicer than having to listen to someone talk. Uh, I, I just want to leave you with two ideas today. One is that women empowerment and women rights are human rights because, you know, women are human and that's... But somehow we always tend to bracket it in a separate category that these are women's issues and we have to look at them separately. So even in the workplace, it's, it's a job that's given to one person in HR that, you know, take a look at how we will fix this gender ratio problem. But it's not really something that the entire organization really gets involved with. So I want to, you know, we, we look at that idea and uh, the second idea about how the change that we're talking about in this entire uh, event, that this change is basically really small and personal and if each of us start to action this change, you'll actually see a difference. Um, before I start, I want to acknowledge all of the uh, current students of IIM and the professors who have been trekking back and forth between campus in Banagata Road and this hotel. It obviously shows your commitment to, <laughs> to everything that you've been going back and forth. Uh, so give yourselves a hand for that. And, um, and the alumni should give them a hand for the fantastic job that they have done. So I work for a channel called Mirror Now. We launched this channel two years ago. The idea behind launching the channel, when we launched it, everybody asked us, why would you want to add another English news channel to an already crowded market? And that was true, it, it is a crowded market. It's a loud and crowded market. So we had to first justify that internally to the organization. So we did a study and we discovered at that point that there were more people at prime time, more minutes, on air were being spent talking about Pakistan than talking about India. And this is actually true for, for two years ago when we launched the channel. And it was also an extremely loud space. There was a lot of shouting, there was a lot of fighting, and we generally 
felt that there was a gap there that could be exploited to create a channel that talks about Indians and what we need and what we want. We so we what we hate, which is what happens in a lot of other spaces. So we pay top dollar for, for the taxes or for the cost of living in the city that you live in, wherever you have flown in from, whether it's Delhi or Mumbai, whether you live in Bangalore, the cost of living in this city, in these cities are on par with say a London or a Paris or a New York or Washington, but what do we get in return for the money that we pay? Technically, um, and I like to give this example of, um, you know, you pay about 3,000 rupees for your cell phone as a bill every month, but when something goes wrong and you pick up the phone and call the call center, you want someone to say, yes ma'am, no ma'am, three bags full ma'am, I'll fix it right away, right? And if that doesn't happen, you get really upset, saying what is this sort of terrible customer service? We don't demand that same customer service from our governments, whereas we pay them nearly half of what we earn, one way or the other. So we created a channel that would make that demand on behalf of the, or on behalf of the citizen slash customer, saying that you owe us this, we're paying for it, we're paying for the service, so we're going to demand it from you. Now, we went out and we hired a lot of very young people. That was one of the changes we made to make a different channel, and we also hired a lot of women. The channel, when we launched it, although now we have one male anchor, was entirely female on air. All our reporters were girls, all our anchors were women, and we were, even on the floor behind the camera, we were 75% female employees on that team. And this was not a deliberate thing, it just happened. And, and I think it happened because we were looking for new ideas and we got a lot of new ideas. We were also looking for representation, so we built a channel where we have people from different states who speak different languages, who understand those states, from different religions who can then represent those points of view, and of course from the LGBTQ community, women and men in the channel, so that we can actually have voices from everywhere. I want to give you an example of what I mean when I say um, women's rights are human's right, human rights. Right? The first story we did that became big, and we decided that we would only pick and do stories that mean something to us, that we feel strongly about. So we started off with this story. Um, there was, this, was, this was about two years ago. There was um, a young lady, this, that ha the case happened four years ago. There was a young lady in Pune who was working for an IT company who after working late one night, took the office drop, which is one of those fleet cars. It was very late, it was in Pune from Hinjewadi into the city. The driver took her into a random secluded part of the city. He and three other of his friends raped her and murdered her that night. Her body was discovered a couple of days later. We had taken up the story because those four men had been given the life sentence by the courts. But we had the young lady's husband with us on the show talking to us in the studio, and he said something very stark to us. He said that the driver had misused the child lock in the cab. He had locked her into the back seat, and which is why she couldn't get out. And he said, if it was not for that child lock, my wife would be with me today. It seemed like a really simple thing, and we realized that first of all, and I'm really glad we have Vandaraji, who, who's in this business, but we realized and we did some research that we have child locks in all of our cabs. And while this case had happened now six years ago, today single women or women traveling alone are using cabs far more because of Ola and Uber and all of these aggregating services. Basically, there is a child lock, which is an American concept which is basically there's the, in the US or in the West, you have to keep the, car, the child in the back seat always, and a lot of times the child is in the back seat by themselves. It never happens in India. In India, you will never have a child sit in the back seat of a taxi by themselves. Also in India, for us, child lock is thappad. You touch that door and I'll smack you and it normally works. Uh, there's always a parent sitting with that child. So we first decided we wanted to do three things. We wanted to create awareness. So we picked up that story, we put out a video showing people where that physical child lock is and how you can check it before you get into the cab. 
That video went completely viral, and we were very happy because it meant that so many people were now informed. The second thing we did is we spoke to government, and we asked them from various state governments to the central government, we asked them to bring in a law that changes this, and it was obviously complicated because the child lock comes pre-installed when the car is manufactured. So after two years of pushing this story, I'm very proud to tell you that as promised to us by Mr. Nitin Gadkari, starting this year, all of the cars manufactured in India will have a detachable, removable child lock. And when, and when that car goes to the RTO to get registered as a taxi, that child lock will need to be compulsorily removed. Taxis will not be able to use child locks. And the best part about this is I believe that we could have saved or we may have saved lives by simply doing this. And those of you who live in Bangalore know that there is a regular spate of cases of people getting, women getting abused, molested, treated badly on this one stretch of road when they're catching a late night flight. And a lot of times it happens because the child lock is being used. Now the reason why I'm telling you this story is very simple. It's because everyone in the room feels strongly about this story. Not everyone in this room is a single woman who will take a cab. But you care that, this, that the women in your lives who take those cabs are safe. You care that we create cities that are safer. Because when the cities are safer, they're safer for everybody. They're safer for the men and the women. Women's rights are human rights. And if we improve the status of women in our society and safety of women in our society and the opportunities of women in our society, we will have a, a better society and a more prosperous country. I pulled out a lot of research, but given the audience here, I decided to go with the McKenzie research because I know you guys like McKenzie. Somebody's sniggering in the back, okay. Uh, <laughs> so McKenzie did uh, one paper that basically says, in India, if we were to increase the work um, opportunities for women completely, we will increase the GDP of this country by 18%. That is $770 billion by 2025. Nobody MBA finance here, $770 billion. Thank you. <laughs> $770 billion is a lot of money. That $5 trillion economy will happen much faster if we can just create equal workspaces for women. So, Bringing in women into your offices is not charity. Women are not asking for special, special treatment. We're not asking for charity. We're not asking for you to create a cell where you think that women are chatting about makeup, where they can go into a room and they can have a day when they do makeup in the office and you know, we'll do this, oh, you know, we'll have women's day and give them all cupcakes. I'm saying that if we create equal spaces for women, your businesses will do better. You will make more money. There will be more jobs. The economy will do better. Society will do better. Studies have shown us that when women are empowered in rural India, when they are educated, crime rates go down. The GDP of the village increases. Actually, the population or the fertility rate at which women are having babies also comes down because now they have a voice and they are able to assert that voice. Every study that has been done has shown us that when you empower women from a workspace, or government, or village, or panchayat, it works in favor of the entire society. I also want to focus on what we can do to make that empowerment happen. I believe the changes are very simple. And I believe these changes are in all of us, including the women here who are managers. We need to just quickly check ourselves. Do we, for example, when a woman comes up to you saying, I need to leave early because of a PTA meeting, do we roll our eyes and say, this one is always running off for some reason or the other? Personally, I believe PTA meetings, which for some reason happen at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a work day, are a conspiracy against working women. 
what the hell is three o'clock in the afternoon? I can't go to work and come back. I can't finish and go to work. And then you sit there all day waiting for this one meeting to take place. There are small changes that we can make. One of the changes we can make, and this one is something that has scared a lot of HR people, is paternity leave. I come from an organization that gives zero paternity leave, not even one day. If a man wants to take leave when he's having a baby, he has to literally use up all of his privileged leave or his casual leave or whatever else he might have. What are we doing? We're sending a clear message that primary caregivers have to be women, that men have no contribution to make, and they're supposed to stand there and clap and eat one laddu and go back to office the next day. That's a really unfair and biased way to look at it. Because as soon as you send that message, you're already conditioning the argument or the conversation that will happen at home. Because a woman has six months of maternity leave now, and a man has zero. So you, we are sending a message as managers, as, an organi as organizations, that men have no contribution to children at all. And that they won't want to spend any time with their newborn. Or they can't spend any time with their newborn. When you do that, then you then send the second message, which is that women who are within a certain age, if I hire them, they will get married and have babies and take six months off, and then what will I do? My life will fall apart. My business will come to a grinding halt because this woman has had a baby. Let's not hire women. If we had equal or maybe even half as much pack leave as we have mat leave, that argument would not exist. Men and women would be able to share that responsibility. Men would be able to spend more time with their newborn children. Who says that there are men who don't want to do that, who want to be able to experience that, that bond with a newborn child? Who are we to decide that there is only one side of the family that can do that? It's really unfair. So while McKenzie has told us that there is $770 billion for the taking, we've actually brought down the number of women who are in the workforce in India. So, it is, so the global average is about 45%. We've gone down to 23% in India. It was in the 30s. In the last five years, it's come down. So while we believe that we are creating cells for women and we're celebrating Women's Day in the office, somehow whatever it is we're doing is not working. In boardrooms, the numbers become thinner and thinner. How often are people making jokes in boardrooms about women? I was in a boardroom two days after Sri Devi passed away. I was the only woman there. And before the meeting started, there were these jokes about how, you know, all husbands are buying bathtubs now. And I thought about it and I realized they're probably not used to it because they've never had a woman in the room. And then I realized, imagine what they would have said if there was no woman in the room. And we can, so initially, I used to feel proud about the fact that I was the first woman there. Then I started to ask myself, why am I the first woman? Why am I the only woman here? Why aren't these rooms 50% women and men. Technically, society is 50% women and men. We're doing something wrong. So while all organizations have perhaps on paper created environments that hire women, that give them opportunities, that say flexi hours, this and that, we're doing something wrong as managers because we're losing that talent. So talent that has spent 10 years in the market being trained and becoming awesome, then drops out because after a woman has a baby, we're not creating a safe space. We're rolling our eyes at these women. We're judging them for having babies. We're judging them for PTA meetings. We're judging them for, for going home early. But the truth is, we've come from a society that is unfair and tilted. Women are still carrying the maximum amount of burden at home, where they're looking after elderly parents, they're doing maths homework, they're doing science project, they're caring for newborn babies, and they're working. And we have the audacity, and I say we because I don't have children. 
We have the audacity to turn around and judge them. Whose babies are they having? They're having your babies. I mean, the other option is for women to just say, I choose my career, but nobody wants that either because we are then called career women, career-minded women who don't have babies. But the truth is that if we create spaces where we treat men and women equally, truly equally, where men can also go early for PTA meetings, where men can take time off if the child is sick, where men can also decide that, listen, my child has board exams, I need a week off to help with the studies. You know, India is the only country in the world where women take a sabbatical for board exams. Someone had to actually do this because the women were disappearing at a certain age, 52, 50, 52, 45, and everybody says, what is this? A board exam sabbatical, where even that is somehow the woman's responsibility because now this kid has board exams and God forbid my child is not number one at everything. So a woman gives up her career to stay at home and make sure that classes happen on time. Why can't we create an environment that is equal for both, where men can also do this? Now consider the fact that we keep talking about it, but we have no equal pay. How many of us women feel that you are being paid equally to the men in your organization and your sector who are doing the same job? Raise your hands. Two, three, four, five, six. We should, a lot fewer than the number who raised your hands when I said how many women are in the room. Now what happens when we don't have equal pay? Childcare is very expensive in India. Getting a nanny to stay at home while your wife goes to work is an expensive prospect. Getting a nurse to stay at home to look after your elderly parent while your wife goes to work is a very expensive prospect. So now you're measuring what is easier. Someone has to give up their job or we hire the help. Now when you're deciding who's going to give up the job, which is the job with the lower salary? Women, as women, we automatically get disqualified from that conversation because our salary is already lower because our bosses are already rolling their eyes, because we're already leaving office early. So we're creating an environment where it doesn't matter how much she tries, Sheryl Sandberg is not able to lean in in India. And then when she's trying and trying and breaking her back and then the question comes of board exams, mom is not well at home, or there's a child to look after, instead of leaning in, the collective decision is that she quits. The amount of talent that we're losing in this country, the amount of potential that we're losing in this country, measurably $770 billion that we could have. It comes from simply two things. To ask yourself in any room, how many women are in this room? So when you walk into the boardroom, when you walk into a brainstorming meeting, when you walk into any room, Ask yourself, how many women are in this room and why? Why are they only five? Why are they only 10? Why isn't half this room women? And what can we do to fix that? Uh, is this room an unsafe place? Is this room an uncomfortable place? Are we making jokes? Are we making women uncomfortable? Can we do better? And do it not because you're doing us a favor, do it because it's good for business, because it's good for society, because it's good for the country because we want to be a $5 trillion economy and we can't do it without the women. We simply can't. In India right now, there is data to show us that women or girls are opting for higher education far more, but that's not reflecting in the workspace. They're opting for higher education, which means they're doing PhDs. I know that I am, uh, Bangalore has admitted the largest number of girls or women into this class than ever before, right? That's amazing. But if we are not able to reflect that in the workspace, and women are excelling at higher education, they're performing better than the men, which means we're losing talent. And we're doing it because either we're careless or we're doing it on purpose. You know, someone asked me, um, India has so many horrid things that happen to women, and it's true. This is the kind of stuff I deal with every day rape and murder and trafficking and all of these other things. Why are you urban women still complaining? 
You have whatever you want. You can wear what you like, you can go where you want, you can work where you want. Why are you still complaining? And I honestly believe that with every generation, we need to push this fight further. So our mother's generations, for example, some of them had jobs, but they had jobs to help the, fi the family financially. It was not a selfish job. We, this generation, has careers. These careers give us identity. It is who we are. We do these, these jobs for us, not for our families. We do these careers for us. It is who we are. That's the fight today. And the next generation will take that fight even further. Today's generation, the idea and the fight is for consent and for choice. Society right now doesn't allow a woman to choose. As much as we believe that we are allowing far more choices, we judge choices. If she's not married, she's a problem. Not married at 40 means something is dodgy. If she's married and she doesn't have children, it means she's selfish. If she's married and she has children and she chooses to work, poor child. The mother is never here in that 10 minute break of the exams with one dabba and one bottle saying, Pile bit of it. how was your exam? Because she's in office, how selfish. If she's married and she has kids and she drops out of the workplace, she is now lazy because she's a housewife. Din bar karti kya hai? There is no choice that is tick marked as okay. All the choices are wrong choices. Women are constantly fighting for the fact that we're being judged based on what we choose. We're being judged also on what we wear. You're either slutty in the office or you're a bhenji in the office. When the men go out to get a drink, you go with them. Bad girl. You don't go with them. They've decided and made business decisions and pitched ideas without you. No choices are fair choices right now. And this particular battle, so if you're asking what do urban women want and why are we still complaining, we have two battles, obviously, because we have two Indias. And in the other India, in the Bharat India, we're fighting for the, li for the right to live. We, I did a story three days ago with, in Uttarkashi in Uttarakhand, in 132 villages, over the last three months, 230 babies were born, all of them boys. Not one baby girl in 132 villages. Could that have happened by accident? Is that chance? Absolutely not. That means about, on an average, 200 baby girls were murdered in the span of three months. That is our India. It's also our India where a pregnant Dalit woman in Uttar Pradesh was beaten because she touched someone's bucket. She was seven months pregnant. They took her to the hospital. The doctor refused to touch her because she was Dalit. He said, Bahar se to tiki lag rahi hai. Ghar leke jao. She and the baby died in the night. That is also India. So why are urban women complaining when we get everything? We are not complaining. We are pushing the envelope. And we will push the envelope. And we must push the envelope, ladies, until every single Decision making room is 50% women. Because the more women we have making decisions, if, for example, there is a female editor of a channel making a decision, she will pick up a child lock story, as opposed to other stories, and as opposed to Pakistan, where she understands the impact of, on the lives of that story. Nobody else took that story up that day and after that. If there are women managers who have been through what others are going through, they're able to empathize, they're able to lead, they're able to guide, they're able to give advice to other women, you will have people help each other up. If there are more women in government, we will make laws actually with women in mind. One of the stories that we did, and I love this story because it's, it's so beautifully, basically puts everything in, uh, in perspective. When GST was coming, one of the campaigns that we picked up from the activists was sanitary napkins. We picked up the story about how sanitary napkins 
were being very heavily taxed in India, and we had this opportunity going from sales tax to GST to bring that tax down. So we appealed to the government and to what would be the GST council to bring that tax down, because only 12% of the women in our country have access to sanitary napkins and to sanitary products. Everybody else is using cloth and things that make them sick and sometimes cost them their lives. When the GST Council finally made its decision in the first round, sanitary napkins were being taxed as a luxury product. It was amusing. We took a look at the GST Council. It was all men. There wasn't a single woman in the room at the time. Now there is Nirmala Sitaraman, thank God. But at that time, there wasn't a single woman in the room. So these men had decided together that periods were a luxury. And a luxury, by definition, is something you can opt out of. So we actually had to go on air and say, gentlemen of the GST Council, as much as we would like to opt out of a period, we cannot. It is not a luxury. And by that definition, you have to make these products tax-free. It took us a year of standing up to trolling and standing up to government. And even the finance minister called us out, called me out, saying there's this one female anchor who's got her numbers wrong on this matter. But we stayed with it. In November last year, the GST Council removed all tax from sanitary napkins in India and made it tax-free. But why do we need to do this? Why do we need more women in the GST Council? Because they're making decisions that affect the way women live. Why don't we have women in the GST Councils? Because states are picking finance ministers who are all men. Because there aren't enough women in the state assemblies. There aren't enough women in the state assemblies because parties are not giving enough tickets to women during elections. What were the numbers in the 2019 elections? The Congress gave 47 tickets out of 337 to women. The BJP gave 45 out of about 340. They don't believe women can win. Of course, all of the women have proven them wrong. There are 14% women in Lok Sabha this time, in the 19th Lok Sabha, which is the highest ever. But is it enough? No, ma'am, it's not. It will not be enough until we have 50% women in Lok Sabha, whether that comes by reservation or whether that comes from simple brute force of trying and winning. That is when we'll be making decisions that save the girl, child who are being killed in Uttarkashi and make laws for the women in this room to bring in more women in workspaces. All we need to do, basically, is change the way we think and realize that women's issues are human issues. It's good for business and it's good for the country. And it'll come by simply changing the way we think. Thank you.